and we're live. Hello, everybody. Hello, Visa. Hello, Josh. Hi, everyone. And uh, we are starting a little late. Uh, yes. I, <laughs> I, uh, I, as I was thinking about this as I was driving home like 10 minutes ago, saying this is this is the uh, um, very special spin ghouli edition, late night edition of Dark Ozarks, because we are we are later if you're watching us live, of course, if you're watching right. us after afterwards, thank you for joining us in Dark Ozarks. We were right on time. Um, he never knew any different, but uh, it did have the honor of uh, filming or not filming, uh, judging the School of the Ozarks on the campus of College of the Ozarks regional uh, art fair or art competition. And so uh, seven, seven competing schools, um, junior high and high school, multiple categories and over 200 pieces um, to be judged with myself and two other, two other judges so community great community leader and artist and another and a faculty member at school of the ozarks in the art department so that started at six and we so got done at 8, 8 20. Yeah, a lot <laughs> and and we we tried to juggle this around and for this this week has just not worked out well twice so <laughs> no there's there was number number of things so we thank you all for joining us and lisa it's great to see you after after an awesome weekend yes it was a great weekend in republic <laughs> so much fun uh, again shout out to the asian aquarius metaphysical fair hosted by tracy terrell and joey smith they did a fantastic job tons of awesome vendors and we had a blast yeah, we did. We had we had too much fun. <laughs> we did. <It> was <laughs> between just getting to talk about projects, talking to the public, and then um, our our ever mounting encyclopedia of inside jokes. <laughs> we we really never not have fun, which is a wonderful wonderful part. And I I'm just I'm glad to be able to share all of that. And and we share a lot. I think it's one of the things that we enjoy most we love doing this we do we really do and and, and we fun. go ahead go ahead no no i says and it's just fun it is it really is and of course we we both um adore history uh yeah. contextualizing history and and folklore and and then and then you get to the paranormal and granted many of the the folks coming to the metaphysical fair already interested in these types of things but every person that came by when we told them we we talked about you know the dark tales of the ozarks and the paranormal it was so much it was very gratifying because folks' eyes would light up they'd want more information they'd pull out their phones they'd look up dark ozarks and more yeah, and more and than and a, quite a few of them were already following us too so. i was gonna say that it was so so if you uh, are are watching and we got to visit at the metaphysical fair thank you so much for tuning in and thank you for uh following dark ozarks it means the world to us and it's just it's this is this is a fun journey of course we get to take it together but we get to bring you all along with us exactly and I guess, and then uh, we, we have a little bit of news. Uh, shout out to actually our first sponsor. Yes. Uh, Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri. And yes. as, as a, the first announcement anywhere, uh, we will be having a major event in October um, yes. uh, in conjunction <laughs> with the VFW five uh, five. Uh, 34 in job one and always buying books so mm. for and that is that is such an appropriate name if you think that we're just talking about always buying books because lisa and i do and are <laughs> always yeah. buying books this is a very specific and special business in joplin with a yes. real location that you can visit and an online facebook presence as well yes and um and actually uh has uh uh, reputedly the largest um, used uh, book selection in the Midwest. So, which is so incredibly exciting. Your Southern Violence book, I believe, came from that. Yes. From Always Buying Books. So, <clears throat> <laughs> let me just demonstrate. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually Lisa's book. She mm-hmm. got this book from Always Buying Books. Uh, Honor and Violence in the Old South by Bertram Wyatt Brown. And I'm borrowing it and reading it. <laughs> Good deal. Hope you're enjoying it. I am enjoying it immensely, actually, uh, along with my study of the Hermitage and Andrew Jackson, which seems to be a nice dovetail. Uh, <laughs> yes. And, and, and it, uh, the books are, are I, I cannot, I mean, I'm, I, I, I fell in love with books at a very young age, and I, I cannot stress enough how important it is to be able to have uh, high quality sources yes. for for increasing your library. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes at, at really good rates in terms of using yes. books. Yes, you you really can, and um, you you can get a lot of wonderful books, many at very affordable prices, and you know they also have very collectible books as well. Um, mm-hmm. Some that I drill over that um, <laughs> are out of my pocket. Right? So. <laughs> um, uh, I encourage everyone to check them out because uh, they, Bob and Elise do a wonderful job there. The, the next time I'm up, I'm going to spend about an afternoon there. And uh, I, I don't even want to know how many books I'm going to buy. Because yeah. I, uh, I recently did an inventory. My, my library is over 2,000 uh, 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 pieces. I can say that now because everything has been uh, included in the library database just for the house and you know uh, official right now <laughs> it is I, I have it down to official numbers um and yet i cannot go anywhere that there are cool books for sale but i do not end up buying more so it is a beautiful sickness and i have no intention of curing myself so okay. always find books joplin missouri we are grateful for their sponsorship yes we are and could not be a more perfect sponsorship let me tell you that's true for us it's it's perfect um and this kind of and that kind of dovetails into our topic tonight oh my gosh yes and of course for for people who do follow they've noticed we've been doing more um remote remote filming yes and and we had you and i had the opportunity to visit one of the most incredible and historic locations in Joplin. A lot of people, um, even oftentimes individuals, I noticed because I posted some photos on State of Those Like Spotlight and got some comments of, of, of people who are familiar with Joplin, but were not necessarily familiar with this location. It is amazing. That that's true. I mean, it's I mean, it, you know, if, especially if you if if you just visit, you're probably not going to, you know to be real familiar with it. Uh, for those who live in the area, most probably know it, even if they don't know the name. Um, and um, the Olivia Apartments is, uh, initially was the most opulent apartment house uh, in Joplin and in, in a wide area, um, built in 1906 for an exorbitant amount of $150,000 <laughs> at that time, paid cash by uh, Arthur Mendelari, who was a young uh, mining engineer from Canada who came down and basically uh, pretty much everything he touched turned to gold, uh, or at least he, lead, lead and zinc. And he, he really had the, the Midas touch in that sense. He really did. Um, and he was, he was known for that. And basically, you know, um, you know sort of a uh, how they refer to Edison as the uh, as the wizard, you know, he kind of had that uh, effect in the in the mining fields. And um, so, at the age of twenty six, he built this apartment building. Uh, <laughs> and, and I will the, i want I want to interject right there. the The Olivia oh, had had thirty four apartments, mm-hmm. in quote unquote, a total of one hundred and ten rooms. That said, I think in our mm, sort of post 20th century nomenclature, we say the word apartment and it is not doing these spaces justice. 
No, um, something more akin would be very high end condominiums or something like that. Um, and, and we're used to apartment buildings being very uh, cookie cutter, all identical. <laughs> every, every living space in the building was different uh, and had different features one way or another. Every apartment had fireplaces and every fireplace in the building was different and unique, uh, things like that. Uh, the, the, the structure itself on, on five floors, mm -hmm. basement, exterior of red brick, garden rooftop. Yes all of it was a work of art it, it really was and it, it um aside from just being very opulent it was uh, designed uh, specifically uh, to emulate uh, different uh, italian uh, styles particularly the pompeian style uh, pompeii had mm. recently been found <laughs> When this was built and a lot of the motifs they found in Pompeii, uh, we would consider macabre because there were a lot of spider webs and spiders, things like that. <laughs> and uh, but they uh, incorporated that into the styling, uh, into the uh, uh, leaded glass and so forth throughout the building. Yellow Italian marble imported and <laughs> on and on and on. <laughs> And so um, let's, I want, I want to jump fast forward to our visit uh -huh. a little bit and, and rewind. Of course, you uh, feature the Olivia in your book. Haunted Joplin, yes. Uh, and we're going to, we're going to get into that. There's a great paranormal history and mysteries uh, yeah. associated with this structure. It is to me. It is a testament of not only the artistic craftsmanship, but just the the overall solidity. The 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 craftsmanship of the building mm -hmm. is still standing. In December of 2020, there was a fire mm -hmm. uh, on the fifth floor that caused uh, extensive damage to the roof and and to the floor. Of the yeah, and, and to the fifth floor and portions of the fourth floor. Yes. Uh, and this was after the building had actually been standing empty for, it, for it quite some time. Been, it had been standing empty for approximately five years. Mm -hmm. uh, it had been um, prior to that, um, for about the nine years before, it had been empty of residence but uh, was being worked on by previous owners and mm -hmm. so but it, it was a it, it was a, an apartment building in use for exactly 100 years from mm -hmm. 1906 to 2006 incredible and that you know so so and for for you know specific uh you know credentials and qualifications uh, we were able to get an invite and a tour yes uh, the public cannot go into this building at this no. time no it no is. it's not it's no trespassing it is a uh construction site um we were there with a guided tour uh mm -hmm. and there are places that you can't just wander off to and no for safety and reasons uh, absolutely aside from anything else i'm i am one of the things that gratifies me enormously is that we're walking through a building that is currently undergo undergoing restoration as opposed to being condemned at this point yes um the, it, it took a very concerted effort by a number of people and, and entities um to make that happen um, mm -hmm. after previous owners had um, fallen on rough times with investment after the tornado 
ultimately lost the building uh, to foreclosure. It had gone through several owners um, who didn't do anything with the building. Then the fire. Uh, shout out to the uh, Joplin Downtown Alliance, who was very integral in uh, putting together uh, the consortium of people and companies that are responsible for uh, now renovating the building. So yes, very very much so, which is incredibly exciting. I'm uh, being able to see this kind of craftsmanship be restored is extraordinary. Uh, on one hand, it can be, although I don't think the Olivia feels this way about it. I don't, th sometimes it can be heartbreaking because so much of that beautiful interior had to be removed. Yes. Uh, yes. For the restoration process. Under normal circumstances, I would find that heartbreaking. Um, but when it comes down to it, it's either that or save the structure. Exactly. It's, it's not a hard pick. And you know, from, from everything that we were able to look at, the level of uh, the attention to detail of not only saving the structure, but really being involved um, in, in doing this correctly as a, as a restoration of a very historic building and, um, and really skyline landmark of Joplin. Yes, it, it really is. It, it really is. And, and certainly the, the, the garden rooftop uh, had, had, has uh, an amazing, an amazing view. Now, and we got to see views from the, from the fifth floor uh -huh. uh, in, within an existing construction zone, full disclaimer, with a guided tour mm -hmm. um, that, you know, so. <laughs> um, the higher we got in the structure, I'm scared of heights. Let me just say that. <laughs> and and, and I, there was no way that I was not going where you and Robert were, were going. Like, I'm not going to not go. At the same time, I'm <laughs> the fifth floor and I'm going, we're a long ways up. <laughs> We, yeah, we, we, had so, we had a good floor under us, but we had a very good floor. There, under there us. are spaces uh, that are open to the element, Jess. Yes, they are. Um, there's open elevator shafts. <laughs> there are open windows. And then by open yeah. windows, I mean areas that simply there are no window there. It's just the opening. Right. And uh, a, uh, a, at the time of the filming, a, a balmy 26 degree. Yes. Gust of Kansas <laughs> prairie well, air coming well, through so floor in places <laughs> in the building. I know. And on the one hand, I am so obsessed over taking photos of this and actually being there. I'm like, never mind. We're just we're just soldiering through. At the same time, I'm going, oh my gosh, I am so cold. I am excited. Uh, there's there's one place in particular that it is going to be the ultimately the fifth floor sort of family gathering and sitting room area mm -hmm. it's going to be near the near the elevators uh-huh i when the restoration is complete i am i want to go back to the fifth floor i want to stand in this beautifully finished space and i want to go the last time i was standing here we had bare exposed walls and a 20 mile an hour wind blowing through the space. And I was afraid I was going to fall out a window to my death. I want that. It is a wonderful memory. Um, now, this was, of course, I had read, you know, your account, we had discussed yeah. the, 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 the Olivia. I find it very interesting. I mean, the building is named. It is, you know, it's mm -hmm. not, and no, nothing against these, but you know, it's not the hers building. It's not the Woodruff building. It is the Olivia. Yes. And that was for Mr. Bindalari's mother. There is, um, even in the, in its current state of disrepair slash construction slash restoration, there is a magic to this building that it was it was breathtaking to me 
I was gonna, I was going to experience all of this, even if I was afraid of heights. Um, we wouldn't have liked to fall. No, I know. I was safe. I was just going. And, and, and disclosure, you know, I, I have a, I, I tend to have a little fear of heights as well, but not there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and maybe you because I was maybe because I was so familiar with the building. But. You are very familiar with the building. You have, and we'll we'll get into that. You have a great history. Of, of investigation and research with the building mm -hmm. as well but i think on on several levels somehow this for lack of a better way of describing it this structure has a personality and a soul yes yes it, she's always had a personality <laughs> i i would i would and i i i don't think i've ever made this particular comparison with a building that I've been associated with or been in. But I I would equate her to a ship. I think that's fair. I, I, I do think that's fair. You know, a grand, a grand sailing ship or a great steamship of the Edwardian era. Mm -hmm. That's really where I would place this structure. Now, also for the record, for people who don't know, they might be driving through the neighborhood, et cetera, at the current state of not being refurbished, there, it, it's easy to overlook despite being five stories tall. Well, that's true. Um, you know, she, you know, you're comparing her to a, to a ship, you know, her rigging needs a little attention and so on and so forth. So, um, and and that and that's fair, but it's you know one thing I've always found though, um, whenever I encounter people who have history with the building, who particularly those who lived in the building at some point, um, and you know in its last years, it you know it, it was not as nice, you know, um, but you get fond memories, you get. You, you get a gleam in the eye when people talk about about it and uh, almost to every person i've i've encountered you know oh i lived there you know at such and such time i lived on this floor this apartment and you know and there'll just be a little lilt in their voice and you know gleam in the eye that you know it's it's a good memory, even even for those that have had. It's, and a lot of those people will then tell me experiences they had in the building that are of a paranormal nature. But um, yeah. you know, all very good memories. Yes, and it <clears throat> now for me, incredibly excited to get to go. Yeah. Um, walking in. Uh, through these double oak doors into uh, essentially a, a lobby mm -hmm. that, first of all, even, even in its current state is breathtaking in its, its artistic mm -hmm. uh, craftsmanship. And just the sense, it is like, it would be the equivalent of walking into a grand hotel. Oh, very much so, very much so. And that's pretty much, that's pretty much the experience that was designed into it, but for long-term residents. And that, that also, I, I think is something, is, a, is I, I'm gonna postulate this, I'm gonna get your opinion on it. Um, but a concept that was oftentimes the the delineation between uh, hotel and uh, community mm -hmm. at the at the turn of the of the twentieth century mm -hmm. was less defined. We you know now when we when we say oh the you know it's a motel or it's a hotel with extended stay or they they turned that old hotel into apartments right we're we're oftentimes I mean, to be very frank we're oftentimes in flying ghetto 
that's just the reality of it. Um, low income housing. We didn't know what else to do with the building. We divvied up the stuff. That was not the Olivia. No, nor nor uh, some other similar, but not quite as grand uh, uh, buildings. They, and for one thing, and this is something that people don't you don't see too often anymore. I said for in some of the big cities, you know, it, there there would be you know uh, a barber shop, a haberdashery, uh, a, a diner, uh, several businesses in the lower level in the in the basement area for the public even to come in and yes then um uh the olivia as well had a full service dining room um for its residents on the top floor um that you know was for residents and their guests only so mm -hmm. you very exclusive you was invited in to an extent yeah mm -hmm. and that the uh the electric uh, mm -hmm. elevator for yeah. the public uh ran 24 hours a day yep and, and with an attendant 24 hours a day yes yes you don't see that very often now we we do have that at the courthouse in, in carthage but <laughs> it's, still, it's still a cage elevator with an attendant but... i still want to ride on that I, yeah uh... Yeah, we need to get you in there. <laughs> now, you know, in, uh, there, there's, this is a, a comparison that I, again, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to make, but I'm going to make it because of some of the things that happened in the building. And mm -hmm. also because the era in which the building was constructed. Mm -hmm. um, the Titanic. Yes in its opulence mm -hmm. um it's it really just the grandeur of of this of this entire location and then very very shortly just around three years after the building opened it experienced obviously it didn't <laughs> it didn't hit an iceberg pretty close Spoiler, but, <laughs> but pretty close it, there was there was a very very tragic accident Yes. Uh, when the building was unbelievably new, mm -hmm. that um, the the cost, you know, the, the if it had been a ship, it would have sunk. Um, and <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, it was not. What happened in 1909? Uh, eight, uh, 1908, actually. Okay. January uh, 1908. So yeah, it, it was it was a uh, like just barely two years old. Yeah, I guess two i was thinking three but um there was a um there was a tragic accident it started out at, at right around 5 a.m the uh, night uh desk clerk uh, was a 20 year old man named marvin reynolds and one of his duties was to go to the basement every night make the rounds there, there the businesses spaces were in there there was storage space for the tenants and then of course the you know the uh, the boiler and and the other um accoutrements of the building you know so he, he he would go check make sure everything's okay and feed the building cat which most buildings at the time would have a cat a resident cat to keep down mice also all of the lighting in the building was natural gas which was very common uh, this was before they put odor in natural gas. Uh, Marvin went downstairs, hit a light switch. It didn't come on. He struck a match. Uh, it ignited the gas. It blew the boiler. It blew Marvin through a brick wall and up against a, po uh, a pillar, um, which you saw when mm -hmm. you were there. Yes. And the fireball then basically made its round through the the hallways in the basement and up through one of the first floor apartments and knocked the couple um mr and mrs stevens out of their bed uh, mm -hmm. burned them very badly destroyed a lot of their uh, belongings etc and these were very wealthy uh, residents and and uh 
uh, there was a lawsuit later against the, the building's insurance company who didn't want to pay their claims. Um, and, and actually through that court case, you get testimony from witnesses that was very detailed, including one of the residents who was a doctor. And when the explosion happened, he, run, he ran to the lobby, saw Marvin wasn't there, uh, figured he was downstairs, ran down the stairs, and he said it took him over 10 minutes to find Marvin in all the smoke. And as you could see, Marvin was maybe 10, 12 feet from the bottom mm -hmm. of the stairs. Yeah. Uh, so that, that gives you an idea of the chaos. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, the, and, and the. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say this the debris and devastation. Oh, yeah. yeah. And just the darkness and the smoke, et cetera. And Marvin was still alive, uh, very badly, mortally wounded. Uh, the doctor carried him up to the lobby. He was burned so badly, his knuckles were falling out of his hands. Um, said several things repeatedly, things like, please don't tell my folks. Um, uh, tell Mr. Bindalari it wasn't my fault. Um, that was the owner. And then cursing the cat. So, <laughs> and I, for for me, it, it to me, it is one of the very important reasons why historic buildings need to be preserved. Why ultimately the public needs to be, you know, post restoration safely allowed into these spaces and understand the stories that are there. This the story we've mm -hmm. talked about this yeah. many times. I've read the chapter, but to walk up those stairs mm -hmm. from the basement, I, I was, it was something that, that really mm, was made, made an extraordinary impression on me the afternoon that we were there. Um, after we had finished the tour of the basement uh, to walk, up those stairs to put my hand on that original railing and realize that this this could have been some of the the last things that that Marvin would have seen in his in his corporeal life. This is this is the space. This is the moment. These are the stairs. This is the wood. This is it was I I some people might say that that's eerie. To me it is such an important moment of honoring those who came before us and it was very somber but it was very hallowed to me yes i i agree and 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 that's often that's usually that's that's my feeling uh in that space um and then uh, interestingly you know it seems that marvin you know it, it has not completely gone either. Um, no. He's been seen in the building, or we, I can't imagine who else it would be in the building and in uh, some of the houses nearby. People mm -hmm. reporting, and I've, I've had firsthand accounts told to me of being woken up around right at 5 a.m. Um, one woman who um, told the story lived in a house uh, very close within, mm -hmm. you know few hundred yards and said she woke up and this was she told me it was later that she even knew about any of this um and there was a man standing in in her bedroom uh who was terribly burned who had his hands over his face um clothes burnt off of him skin very burnt um, and she just saw him there like that for maybe 20, 30 seconds, and then it disappeared. Mm -hmm. And, and I this think is, it has to be more of it in that moment. I think so. And this is, this is uh, uh, in terms of talking about, you know, analysis of paranormal instances, we talk about sentient hauntings and we you've investigated a number of those in 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 yeah. this location as well we talked about great either 
psychic or emotional or just physical energy output, for example, with a battle, creating a, 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 an echo mm -hmm. that, that seems to reverberate through time. This is one of the cases that that seems to, those two things seem to be fused together. Yes, well, I, I just think the amount of energy it spelled in the explosion, um, and then of course just the the emotional adrenaline in that instant from him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, I think they I think they replay in different ways. It's it it is in this particular case it is it is tragic. Now this is not a. Yeah. Uh, um, it's by by no means is this a malevolent haunting no no um uh, you know if anything i feel very uh empathetic and uh, uh, uh you know some, some sort of a uh a bond is not quite the right word of a connection with with marvin have been in that space so many times and these experiences and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and then the other thing, another thing that happens there that I, I just think my my feeling is probably connected to Marvin are are the footprints. I did you see the yes. photo I sent you? That is one of the most phenomenal bits of evidence that I've ever seen. Yeah, and um, that's one. And then. Um, one time we were there with a reporter and photographer from the Pittsburgh, Kansas newspaper, and they, 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 they had a photo of footprints as mm -hmm. well. And so that's online somewhere as well. But it, so for those who yeah. you haven't read the book, but footprints you'll find in the building are bare footprints. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's dust all over the floor and it just looks as if a wet foot had been placed there and, and in spots that where everything around has not been disturbed and, and there's no way someone could have gotten in that position to fake it no <clears throat> and in something that of course we we look at a wide variety of potential evidence mm. Here you yeah, are. are we back? Okay, good. I think so. I think it lagged for a minute. <laughs> it did. Uh, we look at a wide variety of potential evidence, mm -hmm. not only on investigations that we do, but of course, uh, bits and pieces of things that, that show up for other folks, things that people show us. Mm -hmm. in, in many cases, and this is not to, this is not to decry other other bits and pieces of, of evidence or possible evidence right that said there are many times when somebody says well this is fill in the blank and you're like well now that you told me and if you kind of squint <laughs> sure maybe <laughs> maybe i mean maybe and yeah. and especially like I, I i i do always want to hold space for if someone is in a, a, an environment and they are sensitive, they could be feeling, you know, picking up on things that they're like, something's not right or something is not normal. There's something out of kilter. And then, oh, look, there's an aberration. Right. That, was, that possibly was also caught on film. These are just interesting bits of a web to put together. And I'm, I'm not, you know, knocking any of those bits and pieces. That said, these footprints, <laughs> and and you know, I don't know if we're we're going to be able to put them up online for people to look at, but these footprints, they are footprints. Yeah, there's no mistaking what they are, and and the thing of it is, is that I know I've seen them a number of times, and and they'll appear. They would appear different places. It's not the same place all the time. Different apartments, different floors. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, you know, maybe in the either right at the baseboard, 
along a wall, a, you know, 10 feet away from doors um, or start in the middle of the, I, there was one time they started in the middle of the room and like someone walked and then like walked through a wall. Um, and I've even had people who have said that they found footprints like that when they lived in the building. You know, mm-hmm. and so, uh, and actually, one person who who gave me that story was someone that I've known for years and years and years, and is very credible and very level headed, and and she told me that story that when she lived in one of the apartments, they would find footprints every once in a while that just like that. Yes, inexplicable but impossible to mistake for something else. Exactly, <laughs> and and. I think this would be an interesting just sort of conversational tangent for a moment. Okay. There's just in terms of paranormal occurrences and and gathered evidence and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Certainly there's, and, and, you know, I think the public might, well, throw us into this category. Enthusiast investigators who we love this sort of stuff. We're interested in it. We're looking for it. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And certainly there's, as, as you and I have noted many times in our professional careers, journalist and attorney, mm-hmm. there are people who fake stuff all the time. Yes, there are. And, and not just about paranormal, I mean anything. Right. This is, this is part of humanity. So there's certainly plenty of hucksters and hustlers who make up things for, for profit, for attention, um, behavioral disorders you name it it's 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 all there and over the course of many years you and i've seen many many bitty many facets many interesting facets of of human nature the thing that always gets me and as you just noted with your contact who lived in the in the olivia individuals that this is not their interest they have no desire to be in the spotlight they're not trying to gain clicks they're not going trying to they're not trying to do any of this right they may not even remotely believe in the paranormal but they're simply saying this is what happened those to me are phenomenal and incredibly interesting me too and you know because it's they invariably with this instance it will be you know We'd come home and find these footprints, or we get up in the morning and there'd be the footprint, and we never could figure out how, you know, how it was made or or what, you know. And the doors are all locked, but, you know. I, I've I've heard people just go through, you know, everything they tried to do to figure out how in the world this happened, you know. And uh, it would be the same thing when we we would find them because, you know. Every speck of dust be gone. It's obvious what it is, and uh, and you just couldn't figure out how. Even if someone was going to fake it, how they how they did it. Exactly, and and who would even be in there to do it? In many cases, right? Yeah, if they were going to be in there, why would they be bothering doing that? <laughs> <laughs> For someone to maybe find it or maybe not. Yes, I, I think it's. To me, it's fascinating. Um, now, there's also an incredibly potent gangster history associated with the Olivia. There, there is. There is. Um, that uh, Al Capone uh, rented one of the apartments on, on the third floor as a safe house, basically, as a, way, uh, a place for... Uh, members of his gang to get out of Chicago and until, you know, things died down if, if the heat was on. Um, there, there are tales that uh, his aunt, uh, Teresa, uh, was the quote tenant of the apartment um, and various tales about that. Uh, and some people say, well, that's crazy. Why would, you know, why would there be, a, you know, a, Capone safe house in Joplin, Missouri, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, one, one interesting note is that apartment was the only apartment that had a buzzer directly to the front desk <laughs> to be notified if someone was coming in. 
And two, um, in that time period, Joplin um, was a center of a lot of um, gangster activity, bank robbers, et cetera, and had the largest safe house in the Midwest, uh, aside from that, um, run by uh, Harold Farmer. So um, the fact that there would be a safe house in Joplin it would, would not really even raise an eyebrow. <laughs> Very, very true. And, and I think that there's just in terms of Joplin's history and its placement, there are these, what I would classify as contradictions that aren't contradictions that I find really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that it is, in essence, even in the 1920s and later, um, almost a quintessential Wild West town. It is. In, very, in, in a lot of ways, it really is. And its proximity to uh, state lines. Yes. Uh, during that era made it a, an ideal location that you could escape across the state line. Um, because law didn't follow. <laughs> I learned that from Dukes of Hazard, 1980. Uh, <laughs> That's that's really that had changed uh, <laughs> by then, but back in the 20s and 30s, it was, it was pretty well true. You know, another thing is, I, I think another thing people don't realize is that just the amount of money that was in the area because of yeah. the mining, etc., just absolute huge fortunes. And here's here's a nice little story that actually connected to the Olivia um, that. Um, Howard Hughes's father, Howard Hughes Sr., um, before he went to Texas and made his fortune in oil, which ultimately led to Howard Hughes Jr. being the richest man in the world, um, he came to uh, Joplin um, and um, in, in some correspondence to a brother or someone, he famously said, he, you know, he, he wanted to come to Joplin and see what all the hoopla was about. Um, and then ironically, while he was here, he tried to court Francis Geddes, who at the time, he was in his early 30s, she was 16, and her father owned one of the newspapers, and her father, and he, he wanted to run away with her and get married, and her father put a kibosh on that. She then turned, she then uh, just a few years later turned around and married Arthur Bendelari and um, then uh, you know lived at the Olivia uh, until they later moved to Kentucky. <laughs> oh, so she, could been, uh, she could have been Howard Hughes's mother <laughs> instead. <laughs> um, and that really, of course, we the more that you dig into so many locations, the more that you find this. But mm -hmm. just the crossroads of famous people, influential people. Mm -hmm. coming through Joplin yeah. and the fact that Joplin was very accessible by rail from Chicago. Yes, very, very true. Very, very true. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it all makes sense. And so, you know, uh, and I, I really don't have much doubt that there probably was a safe house at the Olivia. No. And <clears throat> another, to me, a very interesting juxtaposition, all these elements that we we just talked about mm -hmm. that at, at this time uh joplin was unbelievably wealthy mm -hmm. yet essentially a frontier town yes. and and in a way certainly from a chicago perspective very out of the way that's true you know uh easy to to lay low and get lost in a crowd of you know hundred thousand miners <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yes now i, I think i remember a, a story being you know a recollection that Teresa uh apparently did not allow drinking yes that the story went that she did not approve of card playing or drinking in the in the uh safe house <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> which uh you know i'm only speculating could potentially have 
necessitated some of these uh, on the down low gangsters mm, finding some other locations in Joplin to frequent. I imagine they did. All the <laughs> lords or <laughs> wild <girls. laughs> Um. And, I, and something that is, to me, really a standout about the, the Olivia, um, in, in contrast to the Connor, in contrast to the House of Lords, is we still have it. Very true. Very, very true. And um, some of those iconic buildings that absolutely gorgeous, yeah, were lost and some lost in the urban renewal movement and so forth. And But she's still there and hopefully will be glorious again soon and the fingers crossed i i believe her uh, uh her bones are strong mm -hmm. i i think that her her spirit is strong it's yeah. very odd for me to refer to that in regards to um, <laughs> a building but having actually been there now it, it was a a life-changing experience for me i also can't help but occasionally think you know, we've talked about these, you know, places like the Carthage Square, mm -hmm. uh, the sense that the entire square is, a, is essentially the courthouse square is built on a giant domed geode, for lack of a better uh, crystal cave, you know, a quartz cave. Uh, we do know that there was a, a mine shaft uh, sunk just on the same block as the Olivia at one point. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just at the end of the block, basically. <laughs> and, and with yeah, that, John, that was John, one of John Weiss's uh, mines. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm never going to be able to drive down the street the same way ever again, knowing these things. Um, well, if you if if, actually, if you go just a few more blocks past the Olivia, I, we didn't make it down there, but Crystal Cave is, is down there in the, in the cave. Mm -hmm. is, is larger than a full block and mm. under uh fourth street so um, it's it, it, it was a party cave mm. i just you know we've talked about the the potential impact of of mass quantities of quartz crystal or yeah. water all of these things we know all of these things are here as well i mm -hmm. i can't help but of course, it's it's impossible to prove scientifically, but just speculating that there's something about the the ground itself beneath the Olivia that somehow is imbuing this this structure with something more. It's, it's entirely possible. Plus, there's supposed to be tunnels that go from it that would have gone from it to the Connor to the House of Lords. So. Oh my gosh! I love the basement. Well, and, and and I have to say that's the first time I've ever been in the basement with light. So, um. it's I, I realize this isn't what they were going that they were they were building the basement for you know for practical purposes, right? The the brickwork of the structure reminds me of Fort Massachusetts on Ship Island in Mississippi. Uh, which is a pre-Civil War fort. Yeah. Um, it reminds me a lot of that. It feels... Mm, I, it's so strange. Normally, you would think, like, going into the basement of a haunted hotel, you'd be, like, totally creeped out about it, especially one in which, you know, there was a fatality that is a haunting, et cetera. I, I found the space, and it was also... It was also cold. Um, <laughs> yes, it was a little bit. <laughs> uh, it was very cold. Our 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 seasonal exploits in Joplin for dark ozarks tend to be characterized by below freezing temperatures. Long story, never mind. Yes. Um, but <laughs> February 14, 2020. Uh, <laughs> hi, we're filming and it's 16 degrees Fahrenheit. Welcome exactly. to the prairie. Uh, but <laughs> within that space, there's every reason for that space to have some sort of dark aura. Yeah. And I'm standing in that space. I'm now recalling that space. 
not temperature wise because it's like butt freezing cold yes but otherwise it felt so warm it felt so welcoming it felt very grounded it felt incredibly positive this yes. space felt exceptionally positive this is mm -hmm. this is such a warm and wonderful space not what you would equate with a you know from the outside looking not not from the outside of the facade that just is and as, you know as we're talking you guys on the outside hearing us talk about the structure you would not think that would be the impression that i have that is the impression i have you, you fall in love with the structure not just because it's beautiful but it, it seems to love you back that's very fair and that's that's true i mean and um the uh the night that it, it that the fire happened you saw that you saw a connection with people on social media and so forth people just aghast that it was happening in, in a different way than you typically um see for something like that you know i i, I was getting messages and calls going oh my god the olympia is on fire Yes. Um, you know, as, as as if you were talking about a person, to be honest. Yes, yes. It's to me, you know, my heart goes out to the location, and I'm just, I'm, I'm very excited of where this is going. Yeah, I'm very excited to see it continue. I, I can't wait to be able to go in when it's when it's restored. Um, are there any? Uh, I know there's other paranormal experiences or investigative experiences that you've had in association with the building. Um, well, I have, um, and I think I, I sent you the clip. Did you see the clip of of the of the disembodied that had the disembodied voice? Yes. Yeah, that's one of my favorites too. Um, um, actually, just down the hall, uh, the opposite end of the hallway from the safe house. Um, it started out with being on the back stairs and seeing a shadow man uh, walk through the hallway on the third floor or just on the flight above the third floor walk down and, and the shadow appeared to walk into that apartment and walk in and there there was one two i think there were five of us there and as we walk into the living room the bedroom to the right the woman's voice says visions and it's startling enough that you see on the clip a couple people actually kind of react to it <laughs> what was that um and, yeah. and my, my impression was that it's almost as if whoever we heard thought we were a vision and yeah. then we were hearing her so uh that one's always got me and then um the other the other experience that has always made a big impression on me is the bat stairwell um yes. full body apparition and and now that you have seen those stairs you can see why in some ways it makes no sense but it happened and it happened to two people um because the stairs are very narrow yes <laughs> um but uh walking up the stairs i was between third and four three and four and the other person was between four and five and i hear the other investigator goes go what the hell and so i look <laughs> up and i see turning to down the flight towards me um the image of a fully formed man wearing a 1930s suit it was it was a a brownish color with a fedora had something wrapped in a blanket carrying fireman style over his shoulder that was large enough looked like it probably was the body of a very small a small man or a woman and is walking towards me and the stairs are so narrow there's no way two people are passing but this is no. what you see and as it gets close to me, kind of pauses and looks at me and touches the brim of his hat in acknowledgement and walks on and I'm turning to watch him go past and the other person is running down going, did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. 
I, I think that's phenomenal. I, and, and now I've climbed those stairs mm -hmm. and it is inexplicable. Uh, and, and I think that a couple of things with, with all three of these, the, the, the EBP or the, the disembodied voice, the man on the stairwell and mm -hmm. Marvin, mm -hmm. um, all are, are to me all point to something causing almost a, a ripple yeah in time and space that's true i mean of course you know well with marvin i, I think it definitely is the explosion the others yeah. i don't know um but mm -hmm. yeah there does seem to be something there that touches because at first i thought the man on the stairs was just you know maybe residual something replaying but then it it reacted to me um, yeah uh and so it seemed to be more than just that mm -hmm. so may, may, maybe i was just seeing him walking down the stairs and even though it didn't appear that we were our spaces were overlapping because there's not that much space there but maybe that's just because i was seeing what happened then and then he happened to see me so within the within the the mm -hmm. idea of a, of, of a crossing of pretty sorts. much yeah the, the the potential idea that the the olivia for whatever reason that she may be her own crossroads that may that may be very true she may be her own crossroads it would it would not be i mean actually that makes a lot of sense with everything there and just the whole sense of the place i mean obviously it, it had an effect on you as well it does it really does and of course for the record i i'm only going off of my impressions sure uh, while we were there i did not experience a definable paranormal incident right but but the 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 building had an made a definite impression in, in a towering impression not to sound cliche, but it, it, it definitely made an enormous impression. Um, I want to go back. Um, I, want to, I want to experience more of it. And it does, um, you know, I, I think, and pure, pure speculation on this, but there are many types of conjurings. And mm -hmm. uh, so, sometimes conjurings can be done purposefully sometimes they're they they can be conjured almost inadvertently or seemingly by happenstance mm -hmm. when you combine the the potential magic that seems to be associated with olivia with mm -hmm. the almost uncanny midas touch that ben Valari seemed to have certainly charmed that's for sure it is um a very interesting I, I think it's I think that there's there's some very interesting research ahead in that regard and certainly some interesting speculation right now in regards to this person. I agree. I agree. And it was fun. It was. It was. I, I love getting to go in, into these spaces. It is it is just such an honor. It really is. It's a privilege. It's an honor. Uh, I, I view it as a stewardship to yes. carry a message um, about them. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely agree. And it, it, for me, it's, it's a bit of a dream come true. Um, I have driven across much of America at various times. And invariably, I would always, and whatever route that I was driving, especially if I drove it over and over, but always pick out my most interesting structures, uh -huh. um, historic structures, places that caught my eye. And I would always wonder, what's the story behind this? Who lived there? What's going on? How did this come about? <laughs> I want to know everything about it. And so and now with Dark Ozarks and State of the Ozarks, that actually gets to happen. We get to go into these places and then share them with the public, with you all. And that's, uh, that's a very special thing for me. It really is. It really is. It's a... Uh, um something that uh, is very fulfilling and, and exciting and 
I'm very honored to be able to do. I, I, I am too, so good times. It is. <laughs> that might be a good place to end. I think that works. Um, exciting stuff ahead. We're, we've got some fun episodes coming up. Uh, and, and of course, get ready to mark your calendars for several in-person events this year. Yes, and, and not too far out is uh, the Ritchie Mansion, uh, April yes. 23rd. Yes, it is. Uh, I'll be there. You'll be there. Dark Ozarks will be there. Super yeah. excited about that. And uh, Ritchie Mansion in Newtonia is incredible. Family Cemetery, the um, Cemetery Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> the Civil War Cemetery, yes. Oh, the, the Civil Cemetery, War Cemetery. Yeah, the Cemetery. The Civil War Cemetery, yes. Both. Yes. Uh, and in April, if it's warm, we could say hi to Blackie. <laughs> 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 the six foot black snake that guards yes. the cemetery i have video <laughs> yes i was there we both almost stepped on him i know not afraid of this and uh for the record okay so final note on snakes i'm terrified of snakes however i have acclimated to the ozarks and <laughs> identifying this is important identifying black snakes rat snakes king snakes don't kill them make no. sure that you are identifying them properly why because they hunt venomous snakes so if you they hunt, they hunt venomous snakes and get rid of your mice for you too exactly so if you do not want to be overrun by copperheads and i don't know anyone who wants to be overrun by copperheads no learn your snake species protect your black snakes your rat snakes your king snakes and other non-venomous constrictors because they will hunt your copperheads that's my public service announcement from <laughs> dark ozarks and from state of the ozarks <laughs> there we go, there we go. <laughs> uh, well this was fun and we hope everyone has a good week and we'll yes. see you next week absolutely thanks everybody thank you lisa thank you alex thanks josh thanks everyone thanks alex <laughs>